best no, but at least it's a first step. If someone said I have two scenarios, it's only true at steady state. One case they have no interactions, one they have a tremendous amount. Then you'd say, I'll take the one that has no steady state interaction and hope it works. But I wouldn't take the other one because I know it's not going to work, okay? All right, so we just have to keep this in mind and we'll come back to it. All right, um, what was my reasoning for wanting to do this example? Not, do we, I'm actually going to skip this and come back to it, maybe. Because it, I'm worried about actually finishing. If, if, well, I'll just do it. Okay, fine. Um, so you remember this example? This is where you've got two streams of pure A and pure B, and you're mixing them together to control the total flow, let's say total mass flow and mass fraction. Just a mixing system and a valve, basically. Okay? I showed you this to you previously. All right, so material balances, well, that's not too challenging. Um, total um, mass balance is here, okay? So flow into the system equals the flow out at steady state. At, at a valve, you could legitimately say there are no dynamics, right, because it's really fast, but that's just an overall mass balance. The two streams going in have to equal this, what comes out in a mass flow rate. And then this is a component balance, let's say, on A. So X here is the mass fraction of A in the exit stream. So if you take the mass flow rate of the exit stream times its mass fraction, it has to be what came in in the stream A, because that's pure A, and B has no A at all. Okay. All right. So all I've done here is then I've solved for X. So what? I took W divided by, plugged in W here, and got this relationship. Okay. The reason I really didn't want to do this problem is I went over these notes a couple weeks ago and I remember it's really hard to explain where these derivatives come from because you've got to compute them and then substitute in a bunch of stuff. Let's see. So I'm either, I'm either going to do the following. Classic professor, right? Either I'm going to figure it out or I'm going to tell you it's obvious if you figure it out yourself. <laughs> okay. So, all right. Let's see, let's see what I'm going to do. All right. So this is easy enough. I, so what I'm trying to do is get the gain matrix, right, for this problem. I need the gain matrix because I need that to calculate the relative gain. Okay, so first of all, the goal is to get what is the gain between these two inputs, W, A, and W, B, and these two outputs, W and X. Okay, obviously it's pretty darn easy to calculate the gains between W, A, and W, B, and W. Okay, they're one and one. They're just the coefficients, they're one and one. All right, so that's easy enough. Now I want to calculate what is the relative gain between um, X and WA and X and WB. Then I'll have all four gains I need and then I can do the RGA stuff, okay? Well, this is not conceptually hard, right? So if I wanna know the gain between X and WA, I'm just gonna take the derivative of this equation with respect to WA. If I do that, I'll get this. That, that, that's easy to see, okay? What's hard to see is why that ends up equaling this. Let's see if I can figure it out. I love to think under pressure. It's fun. All right. Well, that's W squared, right? W squared. And WB... By the way, if you see the answer, chime in. Don't be afraid. All right. Um, so I suspect this is actually... W squared 1 minus X times W. So that would, I know that's W squared, so it's WB 1 minus X times W. Yeah, I think that comes from here, right? You multiply across here. Ah, see this is why I didn't want to get in this quagmire. But now that I've done it, I can't I can't just avoid the reality, right? Okay, so what is 1 minus x times w? Because that's my claim, because, right, if this is, this is w squared, clearly, if this is 1 minus x over the w, w's will cancel and it'll all be good, okay? So let's see. Don't get unruly, okay? So what is this? This is going to be, um, W, which I'll write, I guess, is WA plus WB. Yeah. Minus X times W. That's WA, right from here. 
You see this? Minus x times w, x times, that is w. So x times w is wa. And that's equal to wb, and that's what I claimed, right? Yeah, wb right there. So do you know this term? That means just proven in Latin, okay? Obviously this wasn't a major, it wasn't like I proved, you know, one of the great unknown math problems. Uh, but anyway, I still claim success, and I do so in Latin, if you don't mind. All right, so that's where I did that. Same thing over here. I'm not going to go through all the gyrations. I've proven my capabilities. Take the derivative of this guy with respect to WB, get this equation, play the same kind of game, you'll see it's this thing over here. All right, good. So, now if we want to calculate the relative, right, this is, a, this is a two by two system. So we only need to calculate one lambda and we'll know all the other lambdas. So this is lambda one one, okay? So what you do here is you use the formula I gave you way back when I did the two by two system. It's one, one minus these, these gains here, okay? You know all these gains here because you just calculated them. The one, two, three, four, plug them in there. You do all the simplification, you'll th see that's equal to x, okay? So what does that tell you? That tells you if you want to use, let's say, wa, let's make sure I get the right order. If you want to use wa to control w, okay, and wb to control x, that means you're pairing u1 and y1 and u2 and y2. If you want to do that pairing, this lambda should be close to 1, okay? So is it close to one? It depends on the mole fraction that you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to achieve a mole <laughs> fraction that has a lot of A, then that will be a high number like 0.8 or 0.9 or whatever, and that'll be a good pairing. Otherwise, you should use the other pairing. Do you understand? So it depends on the actual mole fraction you're trying to achieve. And this is why when we looked at the problem, I gave you three problems when we first introduced this idea, and this was the first problem that I, t I admitted to you I didn't see the answer myself. And the reason is because there's no, there's no one answer. It depends on what mole fraction you want to actually achieve. So again, if mole fraction is close to one, then you want to you do the pairing WAW and WBX. If this thing is small, like 0.1, then you want to do the opposite pairing. All right. All right, so now let's... Okay, well, I'm clairvoyant in a, in a bizarre sense. All right, so just going through this, I already said all this, but here's your RGA, okay? We already calculated lambda equals x, so that means these, this has to be 1 minus x, and this has to be x, so the rows and columns sum to 1. If you had an example like this, which is just what I said, okay? Mole fraction is close to 1, then you want to pair, I should have wrote what the actual physical variables were, but this was W A and W and then W B and X. Okay. If it's the opposite, whoops, sorry. If it's the opposite scenario, in other words the mole fraction is quite small, then you'll get an RGA that looks like this. And that means you should use W A to control X and W B I should do this right. W B to control <laughs> I'm all screwed up. W, I got to get closer, it's going to help. W, A to control X and W, B to control W. No, there's the problem, it's a typo, that's why. <laughs> okay, no wonder there was no obvious. Okay, U1, Y2, this should be U2, Y1. I cut and pasted this, sorry. Okay, but an interesting scenario is this one. What if, what if the mole fraction is half, half A and half B that you want to achieve? Now there's no, there's no good pairing, actually. There's no obvious one, they're all the same according to this RGA, like pair these two or these two. But it's a good chance none of them will work that well. Because the gain is reduced by half when you turn the other controller on no matter what you do. Okay? So sometimes that's life, right? There is no good answer. So this has an obvious answer, this one obvious, this one not obvious at all. Alright. Now, this is the slide I've been waiting for for days. All right. So this is a general case, and what I'm going to assume here is that we just have this RJ. Someone just gave it to us. It came out of the book. I don't remember if it came from an actual example or not, but this is a 4 by 4 case. Okay? So we have four outputs and four inputs. Right? So each row corresponds to an output, and each column corresponds to an input. So if I were to write this down, I would typically write the 
you know, Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4 over there, and then U1, U2, U3, U4 up there. Just so when I pick, have an element, I know what it corresponds to. All right, so here's the first thing. As I scan this matrix, and I, I look for, is there a number that's close to one? Well, I see a couple of numbers close to one, but I don't see any number closer to one than that one, right? 0.931. That is the relative gain between U1 and Y1. So I'm gonna pick that, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I should pair U1 and Y1 together, because that's close to one, okay? That eliminates U1 and Y1 from the problem, right? I can't pair U1 and Y1 with anything else. They're eliminated. So that means effectively I eliminate that row, which corresponds to Y1. I eliminate that column, which corresponds to U1. Now I have this little three by three system. You following me? Okay. So now I look, is there, is there something near one there? Okay. <laughs> and of course, if I was, if, if I had a, well, it depends on what you mean close to one, but um, these two are kind of essentially equally close to one, so I pick this one first. That is the relative gain between what? Uh, it's the fourth column, so U4 and Y2. It's called lambda 2, 4, fourth input, second output. I'll choose that one and I'll pair, I'll use U4 to control Y2. Okay? Once I do that, that eliminates this column and this row here. Now I'm left with this little system here, this little two by two system right there, okay? Now I'm like, oh boy, there's only one choice, right? I, only ha I can either use that one and that one, or that one and that one. And I said, thou shall not use negative ones, right? Because that'll make the system unstable. So I only have one choice. So first thing, I'll pick this one, okay? That's the relative gain between what? U3 and Y4. So I'll pair those together. That only leaves one thing left. You might say, that's not close to one, man. Okay, I know, I know it's not. Um, but it's all that I have left. So now I'm, that's the only thing left. That's a relative gain between what, U3 and Y2? No, U2 and Y3. Um, and that's what I have left, okay? So this is the nature of the game, right? If you, let's say you got to this point and you decided that's too big. You understand, this could be a problem. Because what this says is when I turn the other controller on, the gain is increased. Actually, it's the ratio of the open loop gain to the closed loop gain. So when I turn the other controller on, the gain is reduced by about two thirds. Like it, my, this controller is going to be hard to tune. That's the point. It's gonna, you can tune it so it works by itself well, but when you turn it on, its gain is liable to be, what well, says open loop gain divided by the closed loop gain. So the gain gets a lot smaller. That means you're controller gain should be a lot larger. And that means this control is probably going to be quite slow when you turn the other controllers on. All right, so let's say you didn't like this outcome. You could start all over. You could say, well, I didn't like that. Um, but I think in this case, you won't find any better answer than this, okay? Let's say that you got to this point and all four of these were negative, <coughs> or three of the four, then you got to start over because it's guaranteed not to work, right? So we were lucky enough that that was positive and that was positive. But if that one was negative, then you gotta, you gotta start all over, okay? So it's better to pair on a variable that's ten, plus 10 than minus one, because at least you have, you have a chance, okay? So anyway, this is how you go through the procedure of pairing, all right? Um, okay, that's fine. So what does that tell us? That tells us if we think our controller pairing should work um, based on all steady state considerations. And the whole procedure is based on trying to minimize, th th this whole thing is trying to minimize interactions between the controllers, right? We're trying to pick the U's and Y's and pair them together so the interactions are as small as possible as measured by this RGA thing. So these numbers are close to one because that's the best idea we have currently of when controllers interact and when they don't, okay? But it completely ignores dynamics. So here's a, here's a couple of things I'm going to say about dynamics, okay? So there's this, th so here's a typical scenario, or let me put it a different way, a typical problem on a test. <laughs> I, I have you do this pairing thing, right? You do the pairing, and then I ask you to do some additional checks as to whether this thing makes sense dynamically, and this is the first thing you would check, okay? It's called the Niederlinsky Index, or Niederlinsky Stability um, ind Theorem. And so here is the actual, the theorem or how you test the result, 
I know you guys probably don't like the word theorem and stuff, but anyway, here's the, here's the method, okay? But the method, it requires some assumptions. In other words, this is true only if you, this is true. You know, this is how theorems work, right? Assumptions, result, okay? So what are the assumptions of this thing, okay? Let's see if we like the assumptions. First thing says, each, so what do we do? We have a system, it's n inputs and n outputs. So we have all these transfer functions, right? If it's two by two, we have four transfer functions. This is placing constraints on each of those transfer functions. First thing it's saying, each transfer function must be stable. So no unstable systems allowed for this case. Each of them must be rational. Do you remember what rational means? It means the numerator and denominator have to be, the numerator cannot be higher order than the denominator. That's a rational, tra all transfer functions have this property for the process. Controllers, maybe not, but um, all process transfer functions satisfy this, okay? Well, actually, sorry, that's properness. Let me start over, I screwed you up. Stable, each transfer function has to be stable. We know what that means. Check the poles, have to be, um, have a um, negative real part. Okay, has to be proper. That's what I meant by proper. So if we look at the transfer function of each, each of these transfer functions, let's say G11 of S, it has a numerator, it has a denominator. First thing we said is it has to be stable. That, that denominator has to have um, stable roots, okay? All right. Second thing we're saying is it has to be proper. That means the order of this thing cannot be less than the order of that thing, okay? That's a proper transfer function. It means the denominator has to be at least as great an order as the numerator. That's never a problem, trust me, okay? Because if, if, if that weren't the case, that says the process integrates. Processes don't, I mean, differentiate. Processes don't differentiate. Controllers do, but not processes, not systems. Okay. And the last thing, it has to be rational, okay? What does rational mean? It means it has to be the ratio of two polynomials. Looks good, right? But it, that means it cannot have this, because that's not rational, okay? So it can't have a time delay. So, so if we look at this, we say, this is not restrictive at all, but these, all the transfer functions have to be stable and not, cannot have time delays, okay? Otherwise, this result doesn't apply. Okay, that's, that's, that's assumption number one, okay? Here's the next assumption, is that I want to know if I design controllers, if they're going to work, and the assumption of the method is that I'm going to design controllers that have integral action. That's not, a, that's not an unreasonable assumption, because we never design a controller without integral action, right? It doesn't matter if it's IMC or direct synthesis or PI or PID. Um, we essentially always have integral action in the controller. This is not limiting, right? We want our controllers to have integral action, so it should be fine. You understand, we're, what we're doing is we're designing each of these controllers independently, and then we're gonna try to use this test to see if they're gonna work when we put them together. And we're gonna design them each independently so they have integral action, no surprise, okay? And then this assumption says, you're gonna design each controller so that it works by itself. That's also not much of an assumption, because if we can't do that, we haven't learned anything in the course at all, right? Okay. Uh, we have a variety of ways of tuning PID controllers or IMC controllers or direct census controllers so they work by themselves, right? So my argument here is there are some restrictions on the type of systems you can handle, but neither of these are restrictions at all because every time we design a controller, we design it so it has integral action and that it works by itself, okay? So that's fine. All right. So this is how you test, use the test here. Okay, so let's just say, and I'll come back to this, that we've paired the variables like this. We're gonna use u1 to control y1, u2 to control y2, the last input to control the last output. How do we know this? We did the RGA, you know, so this would be the results of the RGA, let's say, okay? Now, the thing about the Niedelinsky index is it's like a lot of things in life, it can only provide a negative result, okay? It can only tell you is that what you want to do won't work. It doesn't tell you if you, what you wanna do will work. So in other words, you come through here and you do this test and if it fails, you fail. If, it's, if it passes, you don't know. It may work or it may not. It's a necessary condition, okay? So this is how you test it, okay? So this is your gain matrix, right? We have this gain matrix. So just for, so if it's two by two system, sorry, no subscript there. 
the gain matrix looks like this. Obviously, you can generalize this to any number of inputs and outputs you want, but if it's two by two, it looks like that. So to, so to calculate this index here, first of all, you hopefully you remember what that means. That means take the determinant of the matrix. Okay, so take the determinant of k. For a two by two system, it's easy to take the determinant of k. Remember, it's that thing times that thing minus that thing times that thing. Okay. On the bottom, it says. Um, so I don't know if you know this notation, but you've probably seen it before. This means multiply. It multiply this means multiply the diagonal matrices of that, uh, elements of that matrix. See the index here is K11, that means diagonal elements. So it's telling you, multi and this is, a, this is just like a sum except it's a product. So it's saying multiply K11 times K22, times K33, times K44, whatever, okay? Check this ratio. If this ratio is negative, you fail. Probably a bit strong. Your, your system, your design fails. Okay. If it's greater than zero, you don't know. It may work or may not. So, I mean, this is, so what are you going to do? You're going to check this thing, and if this thing passes, in other words, it's greater than zero, then you're going to get in science what's known as a warm, fuzzy feeling. Okay? All right. If this thing fails, you're going to get something in science called a nauseous feeling. Okay? Because if this were to occur, in practice, then you'd have to go back and start all over again, right? Because you've come up with pairings that are guaranteed not to work. You couldn't see it at steady state, but now that you do this test, you can see dynamically they're not going to work. Then you get to go pair again, because you have to, okay? All right, there is one good news, though, and I didn't say this earlier. If the system is two by two, then this is actually also a sufficient condition. That means if this thing is greater than zero, you're guaranteed it will work. It's only sufficient if n is two, though. <coughs> It's usually necessary, but sufficient if n is 2. All right, so that sounds great. Now, the, the method is a little bit different, and people get caught on this if you used a different pairing. So let's go through that real quick. So what I've done is I've told you what happens if you pair what we say along the diagonal. That means u1, y1, u2, y2. But let's say that you pair on these two elements. You know what I mean? That means you paired u1, y2, and u2, y1. Then you have to rearrange the matrix before you apply this, this thing, okay? So, the way to think of this is you have this matrix K. And again, let's just do two by two so it's easy to write for me. Okay, so you have this matrix, and you go through the RGA, and let's say you've decided you're going to do this pairing. Okay, that means you've paired using these gains, the off-diagonal ones. Okay, to do this test, you have to rearrange this matrix so these things you've used to, uh, paired with are all along the diagonal. You can either swap rows or swap columns, it won't make any difference, okay. So I'm going to form a new matrix. I can swap columns or rows. It doesn't make any difference. Let me swap the columns. I wish I was smarter. Okay. There we go. I did a little. Okay. That took a long time. It was pretty easy. It should have been easy. I just swapped the two columns. Or you could swap the two rows. Now you have a new matrix I called K tilde or whatever you want to call it. Now you do this test over here with K tilde. You understand? So, so if you pair on the two diagonal elements, you do exactly that. But if you pair, a, use a different pairing, then you have to make sure that the pairings you've used, those gains are on the diagonal. For two by two case, that means you just switch the two rows and columns, either one. Okay. If you go back to this five by five case, which you're not liable to see on a test or anything, that means you'd have to put the, that gain on the diagonal. It's already on the diagonal. That's good. You'd need to put that along the diagonal. You'd need to put this along the So the diagonal is this, right? You'd have to have that gain, that gain, that g Now I'm really screwing you up because this is a common mistake. <laughs> These are not gains here. Okay. So let me re So we've done this pairing here, right? Okay. Now, if you want to do that test, you have to go back to the original gain matrix, which isn't shown here, okay? And then you have to make sure that the gains for these pairings are on the diagonal. So K11, what would this guy be? This would be K24, K43, and K... 
three, two. Those would have to be on the diagonal. Any way you want to get them on the diagonal is fine. You can swap rows and columns to do it. Okay? All right. So once you get this K tilde matrix, then you do the test based on that. Okay? And again, if it's two by two, then you'll, you can actually prove it works. All right. So a couple other comments here is that, let's say I give you this problem. Okay? So I give you this transfer function matrix, right? Every transfer function is a first order plus time delay transfer function. So now you want to do the RGA, because that's what, that's what you would do, right? I would tell you, how, to, how are you going to pair these together? So first thing you would do is throw away all the dynamics, right? Because the RGA doesn't use dynamics. Set S equal to zero in each of these transfer functions and get the gains, right? I mean, these are already in form where you know the gains are those numbers right there. Okay? So you get those, the gain matrix there. All right. So then you go about calculating the RGA. And if you calculate the RGA for this gain matrix, you can, I don't show the details, you'll get this thing here. Okay? All right. Well, I know one thing. 0.64 is closer to 1 than 0.36 is. So I'll, I'll use these two things to pair. That means U1, Y1, U2, Y2. Okay? So that means I'm pairing based on these transfer functions here, based on steady state. But if you look at these transfer functions, you'll see they're not created equal. They all have the same time delay by construction. But you might notice the time constants of these things are a lot different. This time constant and this one, which is what I've used to pair, are a lot larger than those two time constants. Right? A factor of 10. Hopefully if you learn anything in the course, you learn that the time constant of the process determines how quickly we can do control. If the process has a large time constant, then we have to settle for slow control. Because you can't make a system that responds in 10 minutes respond in 5 <coughs> milliseconds. Okay? So the argument here is these time constants are actually a lot smaller than those. I probably should do control based on those. Because small time constants are good. So this is a case where you'd do your RGA, do your pairing, and come back and look, and then you'd look, you ever done this? You look over your shoulder, erase. Just put the others pairing. I'm kidding. You would explain it. But the reasoning here, time constants, too large here relative to these. And even though the pairing says on steady state that you should do this, you actually shouldn't. You should actually use the other pairing. Okay? Now, that's because, you know, if we look at these numbers, we can see they're different, but they're not that much different. Right? I mean, if this number was 0.999 and this was 0.001, I wouldn't say what I'm saying now. But because they're relatively close, they're not negative, then I would use the other pairing. Okay? All right. So that's, that's this explanation here. Oh, yay. I mean, kind of hungry. Um, all right. So, so how are we going to go about doing this whole design? So a common problem now is that I'm going to give you a transfer function matrix like this. And then I'm going to tell you, first of all, figure out how to pair the variables together, right? And then second of all, design a controller for each of the input-output pairs you come up with. So in this case, you would design two controllers, okay? So that's what I said here. Use the RGA to pair the variables, design a controller for each pair, okay? Divide and conquer, if we say in engineering. Um, so how do you go about tuning? Well, guess what? You tune each controller by itself with the other controllers not turned on because an underlying assumption here is that we can build controllers that work by themselves. That's single input, single output, and that's the whole course, basically. Okay? So what have we learned? That you might do a very good design of controllers by themselves, and then when you turn them both on, they don't work well. I gave you that example where they actually went unstable, kind of an extreme case. Okay? So this is very common in practice. You build each controller, you test it in a plant, let's say. It seems to work well. You turn the two controllers on. And depending on the situation, they might interact with each other, okay? Their chance of interacting with each other are high if that RGA thing is not one that you've paired on, okay? Like I can tell you, if you had a problem that had an RGA like this, the controllers are going to interact with each other, okay? If you had a number here that was, you know, 0.99 and that was 0.1, then they probably won't, at least at steady state. But they usually are going to have some level of interaction. Then what you normally have to do is detune them. So you just have to accept that you'll have slower, more sluggish control when they're both on than you, than they, you do if they're one, uh, on one at a time. But you need both of them or you wouldn't, <laughs> you know, 
you wouldn't be doing this if you didn't need both controllers. You just have to sacrifice performance of each individual controller to try to minimize the interactions, right? One way to, the ultimate case of minimizing interactions is turn the controllers off, okay? Um, and so, unfortunately, in industry, that happens quite a bit. They'll find two controllers are interacting with each other, and they'll decide that, usually it's because no one knows what to do, to be honest, and so they'll just turn one of the controllers off and the operator will control it themselves, okay? And, um, I think I mentioned this sometime in the course, it's found, DuPont did a study maybe 15 years ago where they found out like 25% of all controllers in industry are in manual. That means that's a bare minimum, right? You design something, is it even turned on? And um, they found only three quarters of the controllers are actually turned on because of problems like this, okay? All right, so here's another special case. Let's say you had this problem. You had a, a control problem where you need to control reactor temperature and reactor level, okay? All right, so you can imagine these two things are going to interact with each other, right? Because if you have more inventory in the reactor, more level, it's going to generate more heat. It's going to affect the temperature. So these things are not going to be independent of each other if I try to control both of them. But more than likely, the temperature of the reactor is a lot more important than the liquid level. Like, you don't care if the liquid level kind of floats around a little bit as long as it stays maybe reasonably near 50% or something op uh, full. But the reactor temperature floating around can be quite a problem, right? Because let's say you're making a polymer. The polymer has to be made at a certain temperature. You screw up molecular weight and everything, okay? So what do you do? You, you design a controller for temperature. You design a controller for liquid level. You turn them both on. They interact. And then you just detune the liquid level one by itself. Don't, don't sacrifice reactor temperature control because it's important. Re Sac uh, sacrifice liquid level control because it's not. Okay? All right. And then, oh, okay, so this last little example. If we go to our RGA, you remember when I first introduced the RGA, I told you this is the relative gain between Y1 and U1. It's the ratio of these, all these gains, right? And you can see here, which I should have mentioned earlier, if you're lucky enough that one of these two gains is zero, okay, 1, 2, or 2, 1, then this denominator will be 1 and lambda is guaranteed to be 1, okay? So that would be great if one of these gains was 0. And, and this is equivalent to that circuitous path that causes the controllers to interact. It doesn't exist at steady state, at least, if these things are 0. So all this example does is um, tells you how you can redefine an input to make this so, okay? So here I just make a general comment, yeah, you detune controllers, I'm going to show you, you might choose a different input. Actual, if you start to have a lot of interactions between controllers, and it's becoming quite a problem, the system is quite complex, you usually do something totally different than what we're describing here. I wish I had time to talk about this. I used to have a couple lectures on it, but it's complex enough where people had no idea what I was talking about, okay? But if you go into a plant in the refining or basic chemicals, um, you will see this. It's called model predictive control. The most common flavor of this is something called dynamic matrix control. It's made by Aspen, same guys that make your Aspen Plus. And um, this is what people do when, when this strategy I'm describing to you fails. So they've done everything they can to pair variables and minimize interactions and it just doesn't work well. Then the idea is that you go to the people that run the plant, the operations people, and you argue that you need this. And guess what they say? See if you've learned anything else in the course. You say, I would like to do this. What do they ask you? How much money will it make? Okay. And then you say, 